because he's worthy today. Come on, he's high and lifted up. His train fills the temple. Come on, we welcome your glory. God, usher in your presence and your spirit. Fill the house. And everybody said, in Jesus' name. Come on, everybody said, in Jesus' name. Come on, greet your neighbor. Turn to somebody in your aisle. Shake somebody's hand. Make them feel welcome today here at Life Point. Kids are dismissed to go down to Kids Life. What a powerful presence of God. Come on, that's it. Give somebody a high five today. Come on, tell them you look good. <laughs> good to see you in the house of the Lord. Come on, somebody say, I was glad. The Bible says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. It didn't say, let us go and be miserable it didn't say let us go and drag ourselves through the mully grubs it didn't say let us go feel sorry for ourselves but it said let us be glad amen that we're going to the house of the Lord there's something about expectancy and hope and anticipation that brings a joy about being in the presence of the Lord and the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our it's our strength. So if you are having a hard day, if you're having a hard week, if you're having a hard month, if you're having a hard year, if you're having a hard life, there's joy in the house of the Lord and pleasures at his right hand forevermore. This is the place where joy can change your life. Well, you guys got me preaching before I even start preaching. Come on, yeah, I think, I think I got myself going, amen. I want to take you to the book of John chapter 9 today. If you got your Bible, want to hear some pages flipping, maybe you want to turn there in your Bible app on your phone, it'll also be on the screen. John chapter 9, verses 1 through 5, I'm going to read it in the New Living Translation. I just like how, how the NLT brings it out, but this is the story of Jesus healing a blind man by spitting on the mud and making a mud pie and, and rubbing it in his eyes. How many people are familiar with the story? The Bible says, as Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Everybody say he was blind. He said, Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? You see, it's human nature to be judgmental. Somebody say amen. They said, was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? He's a dirty, rotten sinner. That's why God made him blind. That's what they're asking. But Jesus said it was not because of his sins or his parents' sins. Jesus answered, this happened so the power of God could be seen. Everybody say seen. The power of God could be seen in a blind man. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. We must quickly carry out the tasks assigned us by the one who sent us. Everybody say, we're sent. The night is coming, and then no one can work. But while I am here in the world, I am the light of the world. Can you help me pray this morning, Lord? I'm asking you, God, to anoint your word. 
that it goes forth, God, and changes lives, that you would anoint my lips of clay to preach your word. We want to hear what thus saith the Lord. We want to hear what the Spirit has to say to the church today. And everybody said, in Jesus' name, clap your hands unto the Lord and give him a high praise. Come on. Hallelujah. You got a shout in your pocket. Just get it ready. Amen. You see, as I was painting a house this week, a thought kept surfacing in my mind. There are just not enough hours in a day or years in a lifetime to do all that a person would like to accomplish. And, and, and Brother Noel said, Amen. Come on. It's just not enough time, not enough energy, or no amount of physical capability spent of tired muscles and eating, sleeping, and working, and simply repeating the process, is it even possible to keep up the pace to achieve everything we might have goals to accomplish? If our time and energy are so finite, if our lives are precious because they are short, we should have a plan. We should prepare to prioritize our time and the energy spent in such a way that our life's goal, that our life's mission is the most important thing in front of us. After all, the most valuable possession we actually have in this life always has been and always will be our faith, our families, and our friends. Our faith, our family, and our friends. And I don't want you to get it twisted. Notice I didn't say our health. It would be nice to be healthy and to live a long life, but Jesus said that you're not to take any thought for the morrow. He said you can't worry enough to turn one white hair to black, naturally. But there's something to be said about longevity and people wanting to live a long life and a healthy life and to eat right and, and to diet and exercise and all those things. But there's something to just consider today. God wants you to be right with him today. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. And you may have a lot of plans, and I hope your plans include being saved and living for Jesus Christ while we still have the time. Jesus said if we loved our lives, we would lose them. But if we lost our lives or spent our lives for the kingdom of God, we would actually find it or save our lives. I'm talking about making an investment. Church, heaven is going to be worth it all. Come on, make no mistake. What we're doing down here for the kingdom of God will be worth every minute, every dollar, and every part of our lives we choose to sacrifice for the kingdom of God. It will all be paid back a hundredfold. And here's a reminder. Our lives are a gift from God. What we make of our lives in the kingdom of God is our gift to him. How many people want to bless the Lord? You want your life to make a difference. You want your life to have meaning and purpose for eternity. Yes, exercise. Yes, eat right. But also eat Krispy Kreme donuts. Hallelujah. Chick-fil-A. McNuggies. Cold slab ice cream. Whoppers. Chinese food, pizza, Slurpees, popcorn, or candy bars in moderation, here and there. You tell I've been on keto, yeah. But maybe also consider, church, to keep it keto as much as possible. The Bible does say that bodily exercise profits a little. Again, the Bible says no man hates his own flesh or his body, but he nourishes it and takes care of it. We are commanded by the Bible to take care of our bodies as the temple of the Holy Ghost. Don't smoke cigarettes, e-cigarettes, weed, crack, meth. Don't drink alcohol. It's a poison. All these things can destroy your life. Don't abuse prescriptions or medications. Take care of your health. Is this all right this morning? But remember, you can't add one day to your life. You can't make one white hair turn black. I said it. 
Again, the Bible says your life is like a vapor. You only have a portion, a certain number of days. Tomorrow isn't promised to any one of us. But our faith is the real secret of longevity. Come on, our faith is the real secret of longevity. Do you want to know how to build an eternal legacy, a way to live forever? We will literally obtain eternal life by obeying the Word of God and by having faith in Jesus Christ. By His sacrifice on the cross, on that precious blood, we have the forgiveness of our sins. But we need to pivot away. Everybody say pivot. Pivot away. We need to turn away from anything that will interfere with God's plan for our lives. That being said, I'll say this. Faith has to come first. Before your family and before your friends, your faith has to come first. God has to come first in your life. Faithfulness to prayer and to daily Bible reading. Faithfulness to church. Bring your children to church. Bring your family to church. Bring your friends to church. Share your faith with people. After you're born again of the water and of the Spirit. Everybody say the water and the Spirit. Ask me after church today what it means to be born again of the water and of the Spirit. But after we're born again, once we have the message for ourselves, then we need to focus on sharing our faith with our families, how to be a godly father or mother, or how to be a godly example to others in general, to the best of our ability. You see, there's something to be said about the strength of the family. It's a cliche, the family that prays together stays together. When I marry people, I just had the privilege of marrying a young couple that I love and respect, that God's called to the ministry, and I told them, I said, God's the glue. God's the glue in your marriage. If you live for God, God is the glue in every relationship. If somebody chooses to make Life Point their home church and to serve the Lord here together with us in unity, we're going to have trouble. Families always fuss. We're going to have problems. We're going to have offenses. They, Jesus said not if they come. He said when they come. And if you get all upset because you're offended and you say, I'm not talking to you anymore. I'm not coming to this church anymore. I'm leaving. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. You're, you're taking yourself away from that unity, that community, that family, the strength in numbers. There's no lone rangers in the kingdom of God. You can't make it on your own. you got to have a church. you got to have a pastor. you got to have a man of God in your life. Why? Because we got to have accountability. I'm not saying this because I want to force everybody to come to this church or that I would be your pastor, but I'm saying this. I can't make it myself without a pastor. I got a pastor in my life, and I would not follow a man that does not follow a man. Because you've got to have accountability. I'm talking about pivoting away from pride. Pivoting away from procrastination. Putting stuff off. Oh, I'm going to get baptized eventually. Today's the day of salvation. Jesus is knocking on the door. Getting baptized in the name of Jesus is one of the most important things you'll ever do in your life. Don't put it off. Come on, I'm preaching today. Come on, life point, our families are our generational legacy. We're one generation away from closing the doors of this church if we don't share our faith. God has given us the opportunity, whether through our children and our children's children, or even if we don't have children, we can still make disciples who make disciples. And that's what we're all about. It's the family business here at LifePoint to be about our Father's business. Did you know that in the family of God, we can have a powerful spiritual legacy in the church of all those that we have brought to Christ? When I was new in the church, I was on fire and I was telling everybody about God. People would cross the street when they saw me coming because they knew I was going to invite them to church. I met a guy one time. And, and he knew my, my best friend, Johnny Lambert. He said, Johnny Lambert, how did you change your life? How did God get a hold of you? He said, that guy right there invited me to church. 
He's my best friend. He won me to God. That guy came to me and he said, so you're the dragon slayer, he said. I liked it. I got on me. I was like, I'm going to give the devil a black eye. I'm going to look out, devil. I'm coming. But you can create a legacy in the church of, of making disciples. My best friend for the rest of my life, I had the privilege of winning to God. And every time we get together, it just keeps getting better and better. Remember, the Bible says he that winneth souls is wise. Another translation says he that makes friends is wise. And to make friends, you got to show yourself. Don't be a jerk. Don't be religious and, and, and highfalutin or, or you think you're too good for everybody else. That's not friendly. Be nice. Put a smile on your face. Shake somebody's hand. Do something nice for somebody. Be a good person. Jesus, the Bible says he went about doing miracles. The Bible also said he went about just doing good. Jesus would hold the door open for old ladies. He'd help them cross the street. He was, he was a, a good man. So we are not to be an island unto ourselves. It's not good for mankind to be alone. God has always intended all of us to dwell together in unity. You need to find a great community. Everybody look around just for a minute. Oh, you found it. Amen. A family of faith where great friends can be found. After all, we know that you are who you hang around with. The number one thing I see about people who get derailed in their faith, they get off track with God, and they backslide, is because they start hanging out with the wrong people. God's telling me to preach right here just a little bit. Come on. If you're hanging out with people that like to go to the bar and like to smoke weed and get drunk, you better be preaching. You better be telling them about Jesus, because if you're not, they are influencing you. One of you guys is going to influence the other. And I'm telling somebody today, you don't want to be surrounded by people who are on their way to hell, who take you off track with God, and you end up back on the bar stool where God found you, miserable and suffering in sin and in shame. Pivot away from that. Get away from those people, because God has a plan for your life. Can I get an Amen. Get away from people. You want to hang around with the family of God. I want to hang around with apostolic people who are on their way to heaven. To do that, we need to pivot away from anything that hurts the community. Selfish behaviors like addictions that hurt everyone around us. Life point, let's pivot back today to faith and to family and to friends. Let's get back on track to what matters most so you don't waste your life. If we find ourselves off track this morning, let me help you to become reborn or to become passionate again about your life's purpose and life's mission that's God-given and so fulfilling and satisfying, I promise you, it's the best way that you could ever truly live your life. I'm preaching about the abundant life that you can only accomplish by pivoting away. Now I'm going to preach to the church a little bit. Pivot away from Pentecostal procrastination. Coulda, woulda, shoulda. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. No, you're not. If you were going to do it, you would have done it. The pathway to hell is paved with good intentions. I'm going to get my life on track. I'm going to change. I'm going to get the Holy Ghost. I'm going to get baptized. You better do it today because we got a full-time devil that doesn't sleep that's not going to let you. He's not going to just let you get off the chain and get out of jail when you feel like it. I see chains breaking in the spirit. Can you help me pray for one second in the Holy Ghost? I see chains breaking. I see prison doors coming open wide. This Sunday at Life Point, God is speaking to you. Get out of jail. It's time for you to get off the chain and do something for God. He has a plan for your life. Quit wasting your time hoping that things are going to change. You need to change them by the power of God. Everybody said in Jesus' name. He's the author and the finisher. 
of our faith. He's writing your story. The problem is some of you still got the pen in your hand. You're doodling like a three-year-old. I want, I want to do this and I want to do that. God's saying, put that down. Jesus, take the wheel. Okay, he's going to draw you out a plan for your life. It may seem scary. When God first started telling me, you're going to be a preacher, I said, am I? But I'm drunk on Friday and I'm church on Sunday, Lord. You're going to be like Paul the Apostle. I said, who's Paul the Apostle? God said, if you're going to be who I want you to be at the time that I want you to be that person, you got to start learning right now. you got to start growing right now. Did you know that you're growing in God, you're, li- you're living, or you're stunted, or you're stalled out, and you're not growing in God, and you're getting stagnant? People who get stagnant, they fall away because the cares of this life choke out their faith. More important is money. More important is this. More important is that than God. Next thing you know, You're off track because of procrastination. So many things steal our time, rob our joy, distract us away from, and actually make us blind to God's plan for our lives. Do you you have about 20 minutes? I want to tell a story. I got a captive audience today. I want to tell you a story today. I'll, I'll complete the story. John chapter 9 verses 1 through 11 goes on to say about the blind man that Jesus healed in an unorthodox way by putting mud on his eyes. I believe that he was not just physically blind, but perhaps he was also simply blind to his purpose in the kingdom of God. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his sins or his parents' sins? It was not because of his sins or his parents' sin. The Bible says all have fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are quick to judge people who are blinded by sin. Those who, even though they may have physical sight, are still blind to their need to obey the gospel. It's easy to be judgmental, but Jesus redirects their focus off the guilt trip to the wonderful truth that every person in any sinful state or situation can be used by God powerfully when they allow Jesus to touch their lives. Everybody say anybody. Everybody say everybody. Everybody say that's me. Jesus answered, this happened so the power of God can be seen in a blind man. There was a purpose in this man's life Jesus wanted to highlight. Then Jesus says that his time-limited work and the time-limited work of his disciples must be done while we still have the strength, the time, and the light to what? To help people find the glory of God, which is the purpose of God in their lives. Isn't that amazing? God has been showing me things the last couple, I would say six months, things that that I've always wondered about. If you live for God long enough, you come to prayer night, you come to Wednesday night, teaching the Bible downstairs, you're learning about God, you come on Sunday, you're hearing the preaching. Pretty soon you have a relationship with God that's so close, He begins to speak to you, the Bible says, under the shadow of the wings of the Almighty, in the secret place. Come on, I just lost half of you guys. I'm going to go back. Under the shadow of the wings, the secret place of the Almighty, God starts to tell you secrets. He started telling me, do you know why the people in the last 10 years have been pastoring, how some of them backslid and left, and why some of them stayed? I said, why, God? He said, self-development, personal development. The people who grow and study and read, and they come here and they're faithful, they grow. The people who are like, I'll go to church when I feel like it, They fade away. Personal development is what will cause you to be successful in the kingdom of God. Keep learning. Keep growing. And this was another thing that God started showing me. Ministry is not complicated. I'm going to ask you some questions about how on fire you are for God. And if you're just getting started, I'm going to get you on fire. If you're already on fire, I'm going to plug you into ministry. You have to have a purpose to live for God. If you just come here to hang out, you're going to hate it. It's going to get boring sitting on a pew like a bump on a pickle, you're not going to get anywhere. You're gonna be, this is not entertainment. 
But you'll get to the place where you're like, I got to call my disciple. I got to get my person coming out teaching a Bible study to. I got to go invite. I'm going to go to this total stranger and invite them to church. Freaking me out, but I'm going to do it. That's going to keep you on fire for God. So that's what I'm talking about, finding your purpose. Jesus picked those 12 disciples. They all had a purpose. One of them had a purpose to betray him. But he found all of their purposes, and they fit in his plan, and God used them mightily. So he said, that's why we must quickly carry out the tasks assigned us by the one who sent us. The night is coming when no one can work. The night coming simply means that the days are evil and that we are being opposed on every side while trying to preach the gospel. It may even cost us our lives, as it did our Lord. But he said, while I am here in the world, I am the light of the world. I want to stop right here and preach until the Spirit of God is lifted from the earth and the Antichrist ushers in the end time events that will be the pivot point for the battle of Armageddon and the second coming of Jesus Christ, which begins the thousand years of the millennial reign of Christ, which includes the binding and loosing of Satan, which causes the final battle of Gog and Magog, which finally is followed by the white throne judgment and the end of the world. Until Jesus is taken from the earth and the Spirit of God is lifted and the wrath of God is poured out upon the sinners who take the mark of the beast, Jesus Christ will be the light of the world. And we as his people are like a city set on a hill that cannot be hid. We are also the light in this dark world. With a limited time and a limited energy. We only have a limited amount of light to reach our friends and family with the gospel. But together, everybody say together. But in unity, we will shine brighter in this end time church than anything that God has planned since the very beginning when he said, let there be light. In the book of Genesis, he was not only creating all that would ever be, but in that moment, he was also proclaiming the light of the world, which would be his death, burial, and resurrection. He was proclaiming that he would become flesh and dwell among us and that he would give us power. Everybody say power. Power to be the greater things will you do, light of the world. That his church would become so powerful that the gates of hell will not prevail against it until Jesus returns and catches us away. Do you believe it this morning? Come on, if you believe that, clap your hands, stomp your feet, lift up your voice, and shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Somebody shout hallelujah. Oh, help me. Now let me pivot back. To finding your powerful purpose in God. That was Jesus' purpose. His purpose, the Bible says, is to seek and save those that are lost. It's a dirty job, but somebody had to do it. Jesus touched lepers. He touched the lives of sinners in every detestable state. He calls us to do the same. Can I get another preach it, Pastor? Amen or any other equivalent statement that gets me stirred up to preach, also known as backing the preacher or helping me to preach today. All right, all right. Watch this. When we get our hands dirty, ministering to humanity, miracles are the result. God's glory is revealed. It's always the result. God's plan for people's lives are revealed. And we all know the story Jesus made a mud pie. Come, come here, Brother Stefan. <laughs> come up here for a minute. I'm, I'm going to do a demonstration. I'm kidding. Bro. <laughs> come on, let's thank God for his faith. Amen. <laughs> oh. I'm kidding. Come on, let's, let's put the scripture up. Then he spit on the ground. He made mud with saliva. He spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. He told him, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. 
Guess what Siloam means? Everybody say sent. Guess what apostolic means? Apostle means sent in the Greek. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. When he did what Jesus said, he came to see his purpose, even though he went through some not so great circumstances to get his miracle. I would not want to go through that. <laughs> getting spit on, getting a mud pie on your face. Come on, how many people here went through some stuff to get saved? I went through some shame. I went through some rejection. I went through some pain in my life. I had to sever relationships. A people said, you're crazy. That church is a cult. There's something going on there. It's too much. But my life started to change. My mom, my dad, they said, what has gotten a hold of you? You're different. I said, I'm born again. God's changed my life. And just like this man, he had a witness in the community. His neighbors and others who knew him as a blind beggar asked each other, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Isn't that the party animal I used to know? Isn't that the guy who used to drink and do drugs and fornicate? Isn't that the guy that used to do all those other things? They said, no, it can't be him. Some others said, no, he just looks like him. Can't be him. Watch this. You wouldn't even recognize many of us here this morning just a few years ago. But God. Thank you, Jesus. But the beggar kept saying, yes, I am the same one. They asked, who healed you? What happened? And he told them, the man they called Jesus made mud and spread it over my eyes. And he told me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash yourself. So I went and washed. And now I can see. I want to wrap all this up today. Just like healing of the blind man, many of us are blind to our purpose. Jesus said about the blind man when they asked why this man was blind, was it the result of sin? Jesus said this man's condition is for the glory of God. Can I be bold today to say that many of the addictions and battles that we face when fighting the good fight of faith is for the glory of God. When we overcome, when we're finally are delivered, amen. When God's power is revealed, when our lives are changed for the whole church to see and for the whole world to see. Come on, but quitting smoking, when we stop drinking or lying or pornography or whatever the vice, when God heals us and delivers us from the bondage of sin, that's great. But it's nothing in comparison to when your purpose is revealed. The day that you find out why you were born. The day that you finally wake up. And your eyes are open to why God saved you in the first place. When you find your ministry. When you find out how important you are to the people that you're helping to live for God. That you're walking with as we all need each other. As we all walk with God together can I get an amen? This is your invitation to your pivot point. Pivot away from sin and the things that so easily beset you and the weight of the condemnation of the sin. Aren't you sick of the guilt that sin has piled on your back that's keeping you from intimacy with Jesus? I'll close with this thought if the music can come back. To pivot in the game of basketball, for those who don't know, means always having one foot firmly planted when you stop dribbling the ball. You can turn in any direction, but if you move from your pivot point, you're called for traveling. And you lose possession of the ball, and it goes to the other team. I know I got some basketball players in the house. How does the same idea transfer to living for God. Everybody say stay planted. Keep your feet firmly planted in your God-given purpose. You may turn left. You may turn right sometimes. Life can turn you around. Sometimes life can foul you. Try to push you around. But don't let life push you off your purpose. Let's all stand. I got a word for somebody today. 
Life has pushed you off your purpose and you've been wandering to and fro like a ship without a sail on the sea. But I'm telling you in the Holy Ghost today, you found an anchor in this church. You found an anchor in Jesus Christ. And you're going to make it through your storm. Don't let Pentecostal procrastination or only being religious cost you your destiny. Do something for God. What is the cost of procrastination? What's the price tag of I was going to do it? I, I coulda, shoulda, woulda. Are you blind to your purpose? Are you blind to your potential, to your mission or your life's work? If your answer is yes today, I want to invite you to come and pray with all of us today in the altar. Is your legacy passing you by? Do your children know Jesus? Are they born again? Have you made a disciple? Are they born again? Have you told people about your faith in God? Pivot today. Come on, if you don't usually go to the altar, I'm challenging you today. Pivot away from what's holding you back. Pivot away from insecurity. Pivot away from rebellion. Pivot away from sin. Pivot to your purpose. Come on, this is your pivot point today. God, I'm not holding back anymore. I got nothing else to lose. My life is hidden in you, God. I give you all. I surrender my life again today. I recommit my life. I don't want to say that I went to church for 30, 40 years and I missed heaven because I refused to grow and move to what you've called me to do with my life. Nothing short of the purpose.